So, here I am, in a little metal moving box lift with the Lord of Flies themself. Satan, I know, I know, the, the real Satan totes crazy, huh? So, totally like starstruck or what? Sounds ridiculous, but it's true. Would I lie? Welcome to Werewolf the Podcast. We're still ongoing in this particular episode, um, parts, um, series, so you may need to go back and listen to the other parts of the series for it to make sense. We're on episode 127. I always get it wrong, but, you know, I think that's a good guess. So, we're just going to carry on. Oh, shit, I have to say some stuff. There's a description that has loads of really good links in it to the stuff like social media where you can speak to me and other lichen lichen minded people get it lichen lichen minded people like lichen <laughs> like <clears throat> sorry um there's a facebook group there that's full of brilliant people full of brilliant people it's so busy and um there's twitter and instagram and tiktok and um other things you can also buy books down there if you want to support the show there's links down there um we have other authors available like adrian and greg who are both great authors there down there as well if you want to go and read their stuff it's well worth a glance and a look and a buy yeah buy it they're good and um yeah sorry where am i oh carrying on yeah back to the story of course, the girl from Ipanema was playing in the background. This was an elevator to hell, after all. You often hear that Satan never looks like what you expect. You know, you know, from those pictures you get on the heavy metal album covers. Well, this one did, but not in the Baphomet with horns and hairy legs scary way. Well, she was frightening, but in an entirely different way. This one would have done quite well on a 1980s hair metal album cover. You know, the bands, I mean. They're often called sort of random crap, which sounds a bit alpha. The Unexpected End, or Death Score, or Throbbing Purple Veined Warrior. Ugh, sorry, I, I, I apologise. They always have the gorgeous woman on the front cover in partial undress, pouting longingly and usually winking into the camera with big hair. I mean, big hair. I mean, like, volume. You know, like... Oh, Kelly LeBrock in Weird Science. A moment's pause for that. Ah, oh, but then... Oh, God. No, I'm not feeling sick about the gorgeous Kelly, but... Every time I get reminded of her, I have to remember she shagged Stephen the seagull. Oh, God, that's... <laughs> oh. This Satan we have here would have, have been the dream album cover girl, although I cannot imagine she would lower herself to doing something like backcombing that well-conditioned pelt on her head. And hopefully she was... <sighs> something... Oh, she has something horrific for Stephen Seagull when he... Uh, arrives to pay for the way he runs in his films. Have you ever seen that? Have you seen the way he runs in his films? I don't know, what's that about? He's supposed to be... A, anyway. As previously noticed, I was a bit starstruck and shocked at being in a lift with a dark one because I do have a real difficulty with religions, especially the Abrahamic ones. I mean, they're a bit weak-ass in comparison to some of the proper ones like the Greeks and the Norse, so it was difficult for me to understand why I felt completely overawed by her. I, I, there again, I was the same when I met Prince William in St Andrews once. Oh, yeah, I know, dropping names. We won't go into the details of our meeting, but it was an entertaining night, and he genuinely knows a kingly thing or three. I went to kill him, obviously. As I understand, the monarchy are parasites and outdated nonsense. Should have killed him at, you know, at first sight for living off the taxes that, well, that I don't pay, but... When I met him, it was different. He was very cool, actually, and he seemed to have a purpose. A bit of a man crush was had, to be honest. Goodness, he can put away the Colombian marching powder and the quality a royal can get. Fucking hell. I wondered if it was, you know, a left over from Queen Vicky's days. She had quite the habit, I heard. But that was okay back then. We all know why Coca-Cola was called Coca-Cola, right? If not, look it up. 
mustn't have had any ADHD kids back then. <laughs> Can you imagine little Timmy getting fizzy, sugary drinks laced with cocaine? It would make, you know, Red Bull's wings look pretty poor, wouldn't it? It'd be more like Coke's jetpack. Sorry, where, where the fuck was I? Ah, yes, why was I starstruck? Sorry for digressing, it's the Coca-Cola. And I'm giving you an audio wink here. Well, it was the same thing here. I mean, Satan in various forms was one of the big hitters in all of the most popular make-up religions of the world. Islam, Judaism and Christianity. This opportunity was a once-in-a-lifetime thing to do. I, I wanted to see how her, uh, his... Their head worked. I mean, this was like, like, well, you can't not liken this chance to anything else, can you? I, I mean, I thought I was the king of cunts, but this is the, the cunts that bestows that title on those that are worthy, such as myself. She, annoyingly, was still on her phone at this point. I've described her in the last episode, but it, it's, it's genuinely worth doing again. It really is. She was about. Five six and stunning, stunning. Her black hair was finely conditioned and shiny and fell loose just below her shoulders in a perfect cut. Her face was what I imagined as the perfect porcelain skinned, perfect beauty, perfect. She was majestic. She was regal in the lift of her chin. Um, the kind of woman who could dismiss you just with her eyes. You know the type. If you don't, what are you doing with your life? Everyone should feel one of those dismissals. Just maybe even once in their life, just to feel like you are utterly invalid and worthless in the world. This woman could do Mark III disdain with ease. And those eyes, those eyes, they were, um, they, they constantly changed color. I noticed that they were sometimes ice blue, sometimes hazel, sometimes, well, you get the idea, they changed colour a fuckload. It didn't seem to happen at her own whim either. It just seemed to happen with the emotion she emitted and admit them she did. What she felt wafted off her like, like heat into a cold room. I'd seen her annoyed in a micro expression at one point and those eyes had become solid red orbs for, for that single microsecond, releasing a blast of light and warmth you wanted to hide from. I could sense how powerful this, this thing was. I, I was not worthy. Well, I was obviously, because I'm who I am. It just made me want to, you, you know, with her. Her body was, sorry, um, simply ideal. Ideal for me, that is, with my taste, perhaps. Strong, feminine, and built for speed. I was enraptured. It's probably not an appropriate way of describing the devil person, but in this case, it's solely accurate. She perfectly represented what I thought I wanted as a woman in my life. Of course she did. Satan was the great manipulator, the seducer into sin. So she would represent the ideal thing that I would want to do that sinning with. Would she not? I laughed at these very pleasant thoughts and she tutted. Mon dieu. And paused in writing some composition on her phone before eventually she sighed and looked at me with a look of what was total annoyance. See, that is what got you into this predicament. Already. What is it you found so funny, huh? Oh, she was angry and it made me go all, all jittery down my spine, all tingly, all twitchy and in the nethers and that. She stood looking at me with utter disapproval, one hand on her hip, tapping the foot of her leg that was revealed from the, the slit in that, that really black, clingily, clingy dress. That leg that, that was just, well, it was, it was there and it went right from the floor, right up to her. She busted me staring and this made her anger even more intense. Stop leaning on the wall. She ordered. I leapt away from the wall with, without any of my own volition. Come on. Look at me, huh? 
and tell me what you are laughing at. She reminded me at this point of my English teacher when I was 11 years old. <sighs> Mrs. Rushford. Mrs. Rushford was the reason why I went through puberty at that very time. She was probably 30 and tried to dress in a professional manner. She was always trying to hide her natural assets, but oh, how she failed. It got tricky for me to drop enough equipment as she passed to get her to pick it up for me to quell my need to bend her over. I was forever in WH Smith's stealing stationery. I have to wonder if she knew what she was doing to us. I kind of hope not. The figure before me flashed into Mrs. Rusford for just a few seconds, just long enough to get Mrs. Rushford's good boy smile that I would have killed for at the age of 11. Then Satan was back in all her glory looking glorious and I glorified in her image. It takes a lot to count me. I, I, I normally never put up with this kind of shit in life, but she was demeaning me and she had admonished me and I stood before her like a small child trying to explain where the last chocolates from the chocolate box had gone while my mouth and hands I held behind my back were covered in chocolate. I was nervously taking my weight from foot to foot and looking at my toes and mumbling random shit. What the veritable fuck was going on with me? I, I, I was glad Fen was not here to see this. Uh, I was thinking about the way you look and how much I would like to do sin and stuff with you because you look like that. I looked up, met her eyes and quickly dropped my head to view my toes again. I mean, you're, you're like, the, you know, the woman of my dreams in the way you... I pointed with my hand at her feet and then took that finger up to her head, pointing out the whole of her as, as she stood there. She maintained a stance, her eyes were now coloured green and the irises of those hypnotic orbs pulsed with a terrible energy. She was silent and I could not speak as I could see she was thinking about what I'd just said. She finally released me from her fixed gaze and relaxed her body. I felt relieved to have her glare off me as she checked herself out in a mirror wall at the back of the lift. I hastened to add a mirror wall that had not been there before. She wiggled and moved around looking at herself from various angles. A genuine assessment of herself was going on. I just stood there in silence and awe, watching mesmerised. I mean, I'd been to some of the most horrendous sex shows in the world. I would, I've would i seen things that would give the average human the horn for weeks, or maybe PTSD, depending on how your mind works. She moved like a, like a dancer, like like an athlete crossed with some kind of animal, probably, well, definitely feline. Fuck. This was very, very exciting. I know, the use of two degree adverbs seems like too much adverb, but it wasn't. The extra very was very required. I was so obviously excited I had to hide my obvious excitement, very obviously, with my hands. She finally stopped and nodded at the mirror in approval. Hmm, you have a fine fantasy. You should see some of these things that I appear as. Honestly, in some cases, it makes my job difficult and uncomfortable. I won't go into details, you know, client confidentiality and all that, but I had an archbishop to seduce a while ago. She leaned towards me hiding her mouth with her hand as she whispered out the side of it as though others were there to listen. A ten-year-old boy. Honey. Broken glass and feathers in strange places. Mm-hmm. She winked and drew herself back from me. You get it. She nodded. I shook my head. I didn't get it in the slightest. Her mobile then did that notification dingy-pingy thing. It completely smashed the atmosphere that had been created. Thank fuck. I don't think my heart could have coped for much longer, even though I was dead. I mean, there is sexual tension and then, there, and then there's fucking sexual strain. Genuine relief was felt as her focus went back to the phone. Jesus Christ. She said, ending the name with a giggle. Obviously, a private joke of her own. Hey, don't get me wrong, these things. She lifted the phone towards me. One of my best ideas, but they are hell. She laughed at her little joke again and winked once more before returning to her corner of the lift. 
where she resumed the work on her phone. I didn't really know what to do myself at that point. I mean, I was standing in the middle of the lift, my hands hid what was now a, a shrinking, sagging spectacle, trying to work out what to do next. She, however, just stood there and ignored me as she worked sighing now and then as she typed. I really couldn't focus on anything but her. I, I noticed the length of hair kept falling over her left eye and she kept whipping it away with, from her face with her hand. This was uh, hypnotic to watch and all I wanted to do was brush that lock from her forehead for her. I could feel my body twitch physically as though I was, you know, actually trying to do the job. Okay, okay. I suppose we should just get on with it and do this shit already. She pressed the phone screen with extreme effort and the phone just kind of disappeared into thin air. She turned her body to me and smiled. You do understand what this place is all about, don't you? She asked as though I had learning difficulties, which was wrong. I was just having general difficulties in standing in front of her. She waved at the back wall, walking towards it as, as the mirror became transparent and we got a view over her city. She indicated the horror show. See this? This is a demon city of pandemonium. She turned to me and I could see pride in her yellow irised eyes. This is the site that deals with what we call in the business of eternal torment, the basic sinner, she said as she did air quotes around the words basic and then sinner. These, um... You could see she was having difficulty trying to define what the inhabitants of the city were called. These... people. We. That will do. She again pointed towards the view. They are pretty basic. They feel guilt for their sins, you know, genuine remorse. They know in their heads what they have done is wrong, and with that knowledge they are pretty easy for us to deal with. We just sort of torture them for eternity. It's an easy matter for us to place those in this dynamic. We made eye contact briefly as she required me to acknowledge that I understood what she meant. I nodded and she offered me a warm smile as a reward. The dynamic is simple. They get that they have done horrible things and are willing to pay the cost for that. They are just people who got it wrong. She explained. Then her body language fell. The problem we have is when someone turns up like yourself. I mean, they are thankfully rare. I can only really remember... She started counting on her fingers, stopping at seven. Yeah, I can only really remember seven others. Oof. She laughed as she looked at the ceiling. We have had billions fall down here. Literally billions. And yet we have had only seven of your type that girls an issue. She emphasised the your as though she was dealing with something that tasted disgusting in her mouth. Then silence as she paused before she turned to me expectantly. I did not have any idea what to say really at this point. She obviously wanted me to do or say something. As time passed it began to feel more and more awkward. I had to fill the gap that she left. Uh, I'm sorry, I guessed. She sighed and turned to lean her forehead against the glass of the window to view her weird world and stared out onto the scene. I could sense she was thinking and time again stretched into that uncomfortable realm. Thankfully, she then began to speak with an element of sadness in her voice. You see, Will... You see, that, that is the problem, isn't it? She whirled slightly, startling me with a flash of anger. She was suddenly so close and I quailed in response to her wrath. She was so intense. She had a, a power that rolled off her. I felt it. This was so much more than the magic and bollocks even I was used to. And then the, the fury simply left her as she calmed taking deep breaths, her eyes closed. Her face was lifted to the ceiling of the lift and a hand was raised towards it. No, not in supplication, but in real anger, she pointed an index finger, completing the dramatic, dare I say it, biblical pose. You should have to deal with these fuckers, 
She shouted at the ceiling. You made them, and then I have to sort them out. She really wasn't talking to me, if you understand what I mean. She must have been addressing, um, I suppose, him upstairs. I couldn't see anything up there on the ceiling. Her chin finally dropped as she considered something. Then she laughed again, which continued as she saw me staring at the ceiling to see if I could see, I don't know, maybe dear old God. Maybe. Hmm. Just maybe. Again, this was not addressed to me. She was thinking out loud. Maybe I can give him back. She clicked her fingers and the lift stopped. Her eyes went from the floor to mine and that smile she gave me, oh, and how she gave it me, was chilling. Are you sorry? Do you even know what that means? You are not sorry. You have never been sorry. And that is the problem. And that is why I am here. And we have to do something about it. Don't we? Her anger was, well... It was very apparent. Her eyes were fixed on mine and that glare was painful. Now, I, sh I should have just listened. I should have nodded and agreed. I should have. But, but, you see, my big problem in life is there's always a fucking but. And that but is the dickhead in me, which at this point... Raised his oh so stupid and ugly head. I know. I know. This was the beast, the ultimate evil Satan, Beelzebub, a fallen angel, and all those other things of religionosity, nos religion, religiousness stuff. I, I know I should have kept quiet and just like hung my head in shame, but, but no. But no, I didn't do that, did I? Oh no. What I decided to do was poke the badger with a spoon. I smiled at her, and with the inappropriate supporting melodramatic body language said, Sorry, and smirked. Oh shit. Fenrir. We... We both went into canal together. We went into that canal as our werewolf self. We didn't bloody leave the canal together, though. I made my way to opposite bank, and it was just me. Will was... Well, Will was gone. He, he wasn't with me. He was just gone. My mind and his were no longer linked. This only meant one thing, that the fucker was dead. I watched as running men got to opposite bank at canal, and... Powerful torches were shone onto black waters. Back and forth they went. They searched, stopping now and again on detritus at modern world as it floated in a putrid scum on those black oil-like waters. And then it it was there. It was... It was fucking there. There was a, a blackened cadaver partially floating on the surface of the canal. It was exceptionally badly burnt and it didn't look like a human at first, but then... As water did its thing, some of the carbonised flesh fell from its, head at, from its head and the floating object revealed a startling white skull. There, man! There! Get it! We need to t take it back to base, man! Get it! One of the soldiers now radioed somewhere, telling them that Target had been neutralised and they needed a body bag unit to come in and collect the remains. <laughs> I sat for the next few hours watching people come and removed the body from water. It broke into pieces as they tried to pack it into the bag and much swearing and disgust was apparent at the task. Then as soon as all people had arrived for busy business, the people disappeared and, and now I sat in dark on edge of canal. I was uh, in a state of shock, to be honest. I know you probably find it difficult to think that an ancient wolf soul can suffer from shock, but, but we can and I did. I genuinely believe that the will was indestructible. I'd, I'd, I'd never imagined he would actually die. He, he, he couldn't, could he? He was a more of a force of nature than anything I'd ever met. There must be something I can do to get him back. He, he can't be dead. He must be able to, to rebuild and come back. 
we'd got through worse than this many times. It can't be it, can it? My mind was racing. I lay on cold stone floor in dark to think. The professor. I couldn't believe it. I stood at the mouth of the tunnel as a group of soldiers brought out a number of body bags to the waiting ambulances. Their faces were solemn, but imbued with the expression of a job well done. Can I take a look? I asked as they went to go past. I could see the anger in the eyes of the leading soldier. He must have felt disgusted at this request and he turned to his commanding officer who looked at me questioningly for a minute before nodding at the private. They placed the three stretchers on the floor and stepped back. I could sense the anger in the air, but I had to be sure. I opened the first two black bags. The zip snagged slightly on the first one as it caught on the mess within. The soldiers' bodies were relatively easy to identify as they had traces of uniforms and weapons with them in the bag. The third I opened tentatively. I half expected a hand to shoot out and grab my throat. It would be just like a werewolf to recover and do one of those epic jump scares the movies are so fond of. The thing in the bag was not doing any kind of recuperation, however. It was far beyond that. I could see that it was. I still found it difficult to believe this was Will. Could somebody else have gotten mixed up in all this and ended up in this state? Well, only the lab could tell us now. Will. Oh, I had fucked up. The woman before me flashed into fire and grew signs. Lightning scorched across and raged across her body. Great shadowy wings tried to open in the confines of the little metal box. Her face well, it just flashed to something bestyle, all teeth and fucking obvious death. I could feel rage pour off her. I'd fucked up and fucked up properly. Well, Fen always told me that if you were going to fuck up, that you should do the best fuck up you could. And I think, well, I had. But I smiled at the thought that I'd managed to annoy the devil. How many people can say that they've done that? I closed my eyes and prepared myself for... Well, I don't know what I was preparing myself for, but I prepared. Then it was gone. Silence. I opened my eyes and she was back. The amazing woman before me just staring at me. Then she was my dad. I know, weird. I mean, my human parent. He stood before me looking sad. My dad had never looked sad. I smiled. This was getting more interesting. Do you... Do you not feel any remorse for what you did to his son? I let this question roll around inside my head for a moment. Did I? Did I feel remorse for murdering my parents? Hmm. Nah, I told him. You were so fucking annoying. Before I got to the end of my sentence, the, the figure was now the toddler of my first kill and a childish voice spoke. You robbed me of my life early. You took me from the arms of my loving parents. They never got over that, you know. My father eventually could cope no more and took his own life because my mother never managed to get past the depression she felt. Her grief was all she had. How does that make you feel? Again, I considered this. I mean, what should I be feeling? Was I missing something? To be honest, I feel nothing. It was a, a nice memory to see you again. Oh, God, you were a tough little bastard. Honestly, you were so hard to kill when I was that small. I had to smash that skull of yours so fucking hard against that drawer. Oh, God, is, is feeling a little pride wrong? I asked him. The kid disappeared and was replaced with Azza, my first wife. She was here. And my heart took a, a little skip at seeing her. Why my death will? We had lived together for centuries, and life with us was good. Why you kill me? She asked. 
Again, I had time to reflect before I answered. Well, it's a little embarrassing in your case, but honestly, you were the only thing anyone could hurt me with at the time. I think I genuinely loved you, but that made you a weak link in my life. I could be hurt by you, threatened and controlled if anyone got their hands on you. I, 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 I couldn't allow that. So I killed you to be free and to save you from the danger. It was the best thing for you in the end. Do I regret it? I had to think hard about this. I stood and grimaced as I rubbed my neck a few times. Do I regret it? I asked myself again. To be honest, no. Suddenly the eyes had changed to another human, then another, then another. It looked like a shit flick book. Hundreds of humans of all different shapes and sizes flashed before me. It reminded me of one of those, you know, those shitty gambling machines with spinning wheels, what they called one-armed bandits or something. Was I supposed to ask it to stop or was I supposed to wait for it to stop of its own volition? Who knew? Satan kept cycling through more and more people. I was proud of the numbers I'd done in my time, but was getting a little bored and somewhat impatient. I did not want to appear rude, so I tried to slide a hand up to my face inconspicuously to stifle the yawn that was struggling to leave me. The spinning human image stopped, and there stood a... a very pregnant Sally. Her beautiful green eyes were full of tears as she... Obviously tried to control her sadness. She lifted her hands towards me in a, a silent request for comfort. Her plea was to be held, to be hugged and loved. I could feel it. That's what she wanted. All she wanted was for me to hold her. I looked at her. I studied those, those fine features. And for a moment, my brain was overwhelmed. Did I care for this one? Her face was now pleading. She motioned me towards her. Her face contorted in sadness, but I couldn't do it. I could not hold her. Then she was gone, replaced by Lucy. She was looking, well, she was looking fabulous, but exhausted. Her facial expression was now of disbelief and disgust quickly followed by horror, exasperation, and finally stopped at the worst of all, at pity. The beast from the hell pit pitied me? The look of disappointment in those eyes was now palpable. That pitying look hurt me. Tore into my heart. Pity. It took a while before she tore her angry eyes from mine. When she managed to do it, she turned to the wall of buttons and reached for the one at the top. She could just about reach it on tiptoes and pressed it with a relieved sigh. The lift started moving again and she returned to her corner where her body language reflected a do not disturb me demeanour. Her arms were tightly crossed across her chest. Her legs were also tightly crossed and her eyes were stuck on the floor. I felt disappointed. So I, in turn, returned to my corner of the lift and stared up at the broken light fitting as it, as it fizzed and popped. I smiled a little bit as I supposed it was not a fire hazard down here, was it? And that was how we still stood some hours later when the lift went ding and stopped. The doors slid open to reveal Nothing but the brightest of lights. There were no shapes out there. There was nothing, just an incredibly bright light. Satan herself looked at me. And she really looked at me again for the second time. The same look that she'd given me when searching my mind a few hours before. Again, she searched the whole of me and saw all of me. Every detail, every thought was exposed. And then her eyes slid away from mine holding tears. The devil had looked at me and had broken down. Is that the coolest thing to ever happen or the worst? I'm not sure. In that moment, it weirdly felt like both. Now get the fuck out, 
She barked as she pointed at the doors. I opened my mouth to talk, but the extended finger and arm turned into an open palm of stop as she turned her head away. I shut up. She pointed at the door again. Nothing more seemed to be appropriate, so I, I turned to leave the lift. I had to give it a last go. I turned again to her. Her head stayed facing away, but the finger returned to pointing at the door to re-emphasise she wanted me out. So I left. Well, I suppose this was the next adventure. What happens now? That's the end of the episode. Thank you so much for listening. Please do things like download us and share us with your friends. And, you know, we're a very nice bunch of people. Again, thank you to all the actors that were in this piece. Dawn, Greg, Yvonne, uh, me. <laughs> and uh, there's loads of description links. Go for it. Go and do things because... You know, you can join in with the community of Werewolf the Podcast because we have become a real community. It's quite worrying, really. Because you know what? At the end of the day, as I always say, I love you. Bye.